I want to pray real quick. I just want to say, um, well, bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for everyone here. I ask that you allow everyone that has ears to hear, to allow, not just let them be hearers of this word, but doers of this word. Lord, I ask that more importantly, your will be done in all things. That's the most important thing we can pray, is that your will be done in all things. And I pray right now that the words that you've given me to share, I ask that they allow and assist in the manifestation of your will and all the people who are here and all the people who are watching the live stream. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. All right, relax. Rose, you could turn up the lights or Caleb. Because I'm not a preacher. So don't look for me to be walking across and and do it. I, I don't do that. Don't do that. My parents did that. Both of them were preachers, and I grew up uh, in a preaching household, but that's just not me. I'm more of a conversationalist, so we're going to have a conversation. Everybody okay with that? I'm just going to talk a little bit. All right. So I want to thank Pastor Jason and the elders, uh, Mike and George, and, and everybody for allowing me to speak to you today, allowing me to share with you. Um, You know, it's just good to be among members of the kingdom. It's good to be somewhere where you feel like, you know, not just you belong, but where you're understood, and hopefully where everybody understands you. And I say that because (laughs) this word, it's not a hard word. It's a simple word. But my prayer is that, okay, my prayer is that we hear it, and like I said, we're doers, not just hearers. Some people, you know, I... I was telling Elder George before we started, some people I think might reject this uh, just because it's not something you want to hear. But there's nothing that that I'm going to share that's not biblical, and I've got, I don't know, 27 scriptures (laughs) to back it all up, and I'm not going to read them all, just like 26 of them. Um, But I've got scripture to back everything up, so, you know, what I'm sharing is, is just for us. It's perfectly on time, and I think it's, it's a good word for today. All right, so with that, let's jump into the first slide. And I'll warn you guys, uh, 20 years in the Army made me very proficient at making PowerPoint slides. It's just what I do. So anybody here support the military, was in the Army, Sherborne Rangers, who? All right. All right. So you'll be, you know, familiar with the slides, and you'll see the military date. Just, you know, go with it. All right, so I'll open this up. In today's highly politicized and highly polarized climate, Everything is debatable, and we are constantly creating enemies and fighting over anything and everything. As citizens of the kingdom, it's crucial that we understand, one, who our enemy is, and two, how we're supposed to fight. All right, I have your attention now? All right, remember love, because that's important. (laughs) All right, I'm going to stand up because I can't see it sitting down. All right, before we jump into it, let's see how we got here, right? Go to the next slide. You'll see that, what, three weeks ago, Pastor Jason gave a message, right? And this message was all about identity and wisdom. He said, your identity comes from the Father, not from the world. That's an external uh, identity. Not from, you know, your uh, desires. That's internal. And he talked about how King David um, and his son, thank you. He talked about how King David didn't fight his son, Absalom, right? He didn't fight him. He, he, for the sake of the, the city of Jerusalem, he went ahead and just let him take over. He didn't make his son his enemy. Does everybody remember when Pastor Jason preached that message? Okay. Anybody get anything from that one? Anybody want to share any highlights from that message they remember? No? Okay. Next. <laughs> The next week, Pastor Jason spoke about unity, and he said, in order for the enemy to bring disruption to unity, he will attack your identity. That was, that's a literal quote. You can go back and watch the, the TikTok, the YouTube, you can watch whatever, all right? And he was talking about Satan tempting Jesus, and what he was saying was, you know, Satan comes to us and he tells us, you're not enough, you're never going to be enough, and we need to recognize his patterns for sowing, you know, division. That was two weeks ago. Next slide. 
Last week, he talked about unity, right? And what he said was, be like Jesus when you're hanging with, out with Judas. Everybody remember that? All right? He said, let's learn to stay united when there's an enemy that wants nothing more than to divide. And he talked about how Jesus loved Judas, even though he knew what Judas had to do, was going to do, and what he did. He still loved him after that. Love, remember? So the last three weeks, those were the messages. But I want you to see something. Go to the next one. You'll see that there's a theme in the last three weeks. And the theme's highlighted. So three weeks ago, he talked about identity and an enemy. Two weeks ago, he talked about an enemy and our identity. Last week, he talked about be like Jesus, which is the same as saying adjust your identity. And he talked about an enemy. Has anybody got a guess, a wild guess, what we're going to talk about today? The enemy, and there we go. All right. So next slide. And, you know, I'm always going to start with definitions and things like that, so we're going to ask this question. Who is your enemy? What's that? <laughs> Brandy's yelling out names of people. So... <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, who is your enemy? And I've given you the answer. It depends on your identity. It depends on who you are. Who you are dictates your, your enemy. All right? So let's look at the definition of identity, because I want to start with a more positive thing. So the next slide. And you guys may get a kick out of this slide. So identity, by definition, is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. It is a fact. That means a true, undeniable statement of being who or what a person or thing is. Not seems to be, not what could be, what it is. The legal definition or the law definition of a fact is the truth about events as opposed to interpretation. Right? So what that means is everybody can have an interpretation, but the the fact is whatever the truth is, okay? So we look at these pictures up here, and we look at the one on the left. I know it's a little bit hard to see, and I apologize. I could have made them a little bit bigger. But it's a picture of an elephant. And how many people have seen this one before? No? Okay. It's a picture of an elephant, and there's people around it with their eyes closed. And they're all touching different parts, right? One person is touching the tusk, and he's saying it's a, let me look over here. It's a spear. Thank you. I guess I am going to walk around. One person is touching the tusk and says it's a spear. The other one's touching the trunk and said it's a snake. The next one touches the ear and says it's a fan because it's, you know, big and floppy. Another one touches the side and says it's a wall. It's huge. I can't get around it. Another one touches the leg and says it's a tree. It feels like a tree. And even the last one touches the tail and says it's a rope. Are those facts? They're not facts. Why aren't they facts? <laughs> Their perceptions? <clears throat> Was it? Wow. We said it wasn't facts. Ivy, share why it's not a fact. I said it's their perception. It is their perception. Anybody else? Anybody agree or disagree? Yeah, okay, she's right. It's their perception. The fact of the matter is what? What? What is it? It's an elephant, right? We can see that. They have their eyes closed. They can't see it. They only see a, they only feel or sense a part of it. But it's an elephant. That's the fact of the matter. So that one's pretty easy. The next one, a little bit harder. You have two people who are looking at an image on the ground. One says, it's a six. The other one says, it's a nine. What do you guys think it is? It's perception. Marvin said it's, it's how you perceive it. Who else says it's perception? It's a fact for both of them. Jack says it's a fact for both of them because one sees a six and one sees a nine. That's a fact. That's what it is, right? OK. Well, in contemporary wisdom, Jack's right. One sees a six, one sees a nine. Undeniable. You see it. It depends on which way they're looking at it. 
But here's the way the Holy Spirit gave it to me. That image on the ground, what it is, it's what the creator says it is. One sees it as a six because that's what they perceive it to be. One sees it as a nine it's because that's what they perceive it to be. But the person who put it there, they know what it is. What if I told you that the person on the left in the green shirt, when they walked up to it, there were arrows leading to it and arrows with a number after each arrow. There was a one, there was a two, there was a three, and they got all the way to the six. And you see this picture. Who's right in that case? The one on the left is right because the creator made it so. You see the one through six. It's obviously a six. There's a pattern. What if it went the other way? What if there was numbers on the other side from one through eight, and then you got to the nine? Who's right then? The person on the right. Why? Because the person who made it said what it was. It's a nine. Can't you see the one through eight to get here? You see a six because you're looking at it upside down, but it's a nine. You guys get that? All right? So when we think about identity, we think about the person who created it dictates the identity. What if I told you that the person who created it ran out of black paint and walked away to go get some more? And when he came back, they said, what is this? It's a six or a nine? He said, no, it's an I. I haven't finished drawing it yet. And both of them are wrong. It's not either one, not what they thought it was. So the whole point of this is to help you understand that the truth of the matter is the object is what it says, we, says what, the object is what the creator says it is, not what we perceive it to be, all right? Our identity as citizens of the kingdom of God is not based on opinion, perception, or misconstrued and incomplete evidence. Our identity is who God says we are, amen? All right, next slide. So if our identity is who God says we are, then who does God say we are? Now that depends on, again, your identity. Can anybody define the kingdom of God for me? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Not Mike. <laughs> Mike has already authored a definition, and I'll come to him last. But anybody want to define the kingdom of God? Anybody want to take a stab at it? I mean, you're all citizens of the kingdom. Anybody want to define what the kingdom is? Where the king is. Good. That's a good start. Where the king is. Who else? He's inside of you. That's where the king is. The kingdom of God is in you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, Mike. You want to give Mike a... Yeah, Mike, Mike. Mike, Mike, please. Please. It's the power and the authority that are ingrained in the person of the king. There you go. It's the power and the authority that's ingrained in the person of the king, and it's his rule and reign over his domain. So we are all part of the kingdom because we entered into his kingdom, right? How do you enter into the kingdom? Anybody want to answer that question? We got a mic. <laughs> Jen, surrender, that's a good one. But yeah, and that's, that's partially true, yes. You have to surrender. By faith through grace, okay, that's, that's part of it. That's a big part of it, by faith. Anybody else? How do, Jack. There you go. Accepting his word and accepting him as his king. You know, I wonder if there's an actual scripture that says how we can enter. You know what, I think there is. Romans 10.9, Romans 10.9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, right? And everybody here has done that. So we're all part of the kingdom, right? Right? And, once you, and Mike will tell you, once you accept him and believe, once you get water baptized and you, you go through that physical act of dying to your old self so you can mentally change your mind and see yourself differently, and then once you get baptized in the Holy Spirit where you actually have his spirit living in you so you can walk differently, that's when you have the fullness of the kingdom. Mike, sound good? All right, good. Check on learning, man. Mike's my, my check stop here. And George, fine. Thank you. <laughs> if I start going off doctrine, let me know. So that's, that's the kingdom, right? 
So in the kingdom, since we're all members of the kingdom, what does God call us? Who are we in the kingdom? What is our identity? There are many, many things that God calls us, right? I'm just going to give you four of them. You can go through your Bible, and there's so many good ones. But the first one I have here is children of God. We are children of God, right? John 1, 10, 13 says he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. That's that whole born again, right? You confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, water baptism, Holy Spirit baptism, you're now a child of God. How many people think that everybody on the planet is a child of God? Raise your hand if you think that. Hmm. How many people think everybody on the planet is not a child of God? Some of y'all aren't answering. What's up with that? <laughs> okay. Some people say, yes, everybody on the planet is. Some people say, not everybody is. You know how we find out? We go to Scripture. That's the only way to find out. 1 John 3.10 says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is it the one who does not love his brother. Everybody say love. So, there are children of God and there are children of the enemy, right? Did you guys know that? Well, you know it now. All right? So not everybody you meet is a child of God. They're not. But they can be. That doesn't make it us or them. It doesn't make it us against them. It's supposed to be all of us because he loves all of us. Undeniably, unconditionally, he loves all of us, right? He loves folks who are not children as much as he loves the folks who he calls children. We have a question. Awesome. Look over there. Don't look at me. When God called all the sons in and Satan came in on the book of Job, he said when the sons of God came, um, came before him. So in that book, he also describes Satan as a son of God. And I think it's in Hebrews um, where it talks about have, we, have you not all been called little gods? So that's also to children of God. That's all. Yeah, so you, you want to go to deeper discussions with that one. <laughs> and I, I will tell you, there's, there's a whole lot of uh, literature, documentation. I'm going to point you to Mr. Mike Dorsey, because what you just talked about, there's a whole lot of theology behind it, that it's not what it, it appears to be. Okay, I, I'm not going to get into it now, because I don't want to scare people and, and get people confused. But he, he wasn't calling us gods. There's, there's, yeah, I'll leave it at that. There's, there's a whole bunch of documentation around that. And Mike Dorsey is the guy you want to talk to about that. Or Elder George, they have all the answers. They have all the documentation. They can walk you through that. I was going to say, <laughs> they can walk you through that. But does not distinguish him as a son of God. There you go. There you go. All right. Did, did we, are we good? All right. I'm going to leave you hanging. All right. All right. So the next one is his workmanship, right? Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And the way Mike says it, whenever you see Christ Jesus, you can say Christ the anointed king, all right, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, there are versions to say we are his masterpiece. You know, we are his handiwork. We're he created us, you know, in such an amazing fashion that it's something to be beheld, right? It's not just a normal, random thing. You know, he created us wonderfully, right? So that's your identity. The first one is you're a child of God. The second one is you're his handiwork. He created you wonderfully, right? The third one is you are forgiven and redeemed. How many people here all the time want, uh, I'm a sinner saved by grace? How many people still say that? Well, you're not. I just want to let you know. 
Romans 10, 9, what do we say? Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you are saved. Once you're saved, are you still a sinner? Is it possible to still sin once you're saved? Yeah, of course. But are you a sinner? Right? What are you? What does he call you? He calls you forgiven and redeemed. 1 John 1, 9 says, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't hold your sin against you, okay? He's not some Lord just sitting there waiting for you to mess up so he can write it down. You messed up again this week. You know, you got to spend 30 hours in prayer this week to, to atone for No, no. He died to pay for the sins of the world. That's done. Do you guys get that? You are forgiven and you are redeemed. All right? The last one is you are a new creation or a new person. Second Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. That means you're not what you used to be. You know, we're still human beings. We're still us from, an, you know, people can see us. We still have the same name. We may still walk the same, but we're new people. We're a new creation, right? Something actually changes in us when we come to Christ. And it's evident to everyone around us, or at least it should be evident to everyone around us. All right, and there are so many more attributes. He calls us beloved. He calls, a friend, he calls us friend of God. And he calls us free, free from punishment of sin and the sting of death. Now, I want to take a quick note here to say the freedom that we get from God supersedes any other freedom that you could ever receive from any government, organization, whatever, man-made entity. You know, because here's the thing. Freedom that's given to you by a pen can be taken away by a pen. Freedom that's given to you by a piece of paper can be taken away by a piece of paper. But the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The kind of liberty that had Paul and Silas in jail praising God, shackled and chained, and they were still praising his name. What kind of freedom is that? That's, that's real freedom. That's not earthly freedom. My right to do this. No, real freedom is when you can be in a fiery furnace, walking around, getting unscathed. That's freedom. Think about that. That's the God we serve. He gives us that freedom. All right? And it's yours. Because you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart. Right? Everybody believe this? You believe you have that freedom? You believe that your freedom in God supersedes all other freedoms that the world can give you? Okay. Let's walk in it. So now that we know who we are, let's talk a little bit about who our enemy is. Dun, dun, dun. Right? All right. Next slide. Again, I'm with the definitions. I apologize. It's a military thing. So an enemy is a person who is actively opposed or hostile to something or someone. Flip that around. A hostile nation or its armed forces or citizens, especially in time of war, or a thing that harms or weakens somebody else or something else. All right? Can anybody think of any hostile relationships? What is a hostile relationship is, you know, things that oppose each other. Anybody got an example of a hostile relationship? Mike? John 10, 10, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Absolutely. That's hostile. Any, anybody else, any, any contemporary, modern-day, normal hostile relationships that you can think of in today's day and age? Democrats and Republicans, right up top. <laughs> Anybody else? Hostile relationships? Anybody that tries to ruin your relationship with God? There you go. Got another one over here? Say that again. A police officer and a citizen. That's really sad because... You know, police officers are supposed to be peace officers, but yes, in today's day and age, yeah, that's it's a hostile relationship. And it's unfortunate because, you know, police officers really interact with people at their worst point, and that's really not a good time to get to know somebody or, or get to see a person. You know, it's, yeah, I agree. It is a hostile relationship, especially when that person is, has done something wrong or is having a really, really bad day. 
made some really bad decisions and it's caused them to have to interact with that police officer for the wrong reason. So yeah. Anybody else? All right, so I'll give you a couple. Baptist versus Pentecostal. <laughs> you got the once saved, always saved versus the mess around and find out and you'll see how quick you lose your salvation, right? <laughs> Millennials versus, versus boomers. I knew you were going to laugh at that one. Millennials versus boomers. Wisdom versus new age, right? The haves and the have-nots, right? Status quo versus equality and equity. If you have it, you want to keep it. You don't want to give it away. If you don't have it, you want what everybody else has. Have, have not. Conservative versus liberal, right? Fiscal responsibility versus social responsibility. Save the money, save the people. Always fighting. We the people versus public policy. I'm going to sip my tea for a second for this one. We the people versus public policy. Mask and vaccine versus no mask and no vaccine. Hostile relationships, right? All right. So up until this point, a lot of the world continues to think the way the Old Testament did. How did the Old Testament see enemies and evildoers? What was their way of dealing with, with enemies? Anybody have any thoughts? Kill them. That, that was... <laughs> That was a good way to end it. War. War was another way. Anybody think of any scriptures that talked about enemies? I got a couple. <laughs> All right. Psalm 139, 19 through 22 says, uh, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O omen of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Where is the love? Where is the love? You know where the love is? It's in Jesus. He hadn't come yet. This is the Old Testament. All right? Another one, Psalms 149 through 11. As for the head of those who surround me, let the mischief of their lips overwhelm them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into fire, into miry pits, no more to rise. Let not the slander be establishment in the land, established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. That's some harsh language. That's in the Bible. But again, that was before Jesus. Okay? Everybody get that? All right. And the old law, you know, the way, the way that we used to think about it before Jesus, you guys have heard this one before, Leviticus 24, 15 through 22. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just pull out the part where you're going to get it. If a man causes defigurement of his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused defigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. Payback. You do something wrong, you deserve to have it back to you. Anybody see that in today's world? You get me, I'm going to get you. And I, sometimes I got to get you before you get me. Right? There's no love in that. There is absolutely no love in that. What's that, Mike? Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. No, I'm looking for people to share. So, under the new law, right, when Jesus came, he said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. So does that mean we still have to do all of the 613 commandments that were out there in the Old Testament? No. What he said to us was very evident. He said, and they asked him a question in Matthew 22, 36 to 39. Uh, a Pharisee, after the, you know, he had stumped the scribes, the Pharisee came up and said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with, all, with all your mind. This is the first great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and all the prophets. What does that mean? Anybody want to take a stab at what that means? Why those two things are so critical and so important? No? Oh.
You're absolutely right. When you love, you won't steal, you won't kill, kill, you won't destroy. Science, stop laughing at me. You won't do things that you know don't make sense. You won't do things that hurt other people. You won't uh, uh, blaspheme. You won't do anything. When you love God first, you're seeking after his heart. You're looking for him. You're going to want to do the same thing for everyone around you. All right? Is that an image of the world we live in today? No? So my question is, if it's not an image of the world we live in today, is the world that we live in the kingdom of God? No? Okay. Was that? Not yet. Good answer. Not yet. Our job is to make it the kingdom of God, but not how you think. So if it's not the kingdom of God and there is a world, then are there other kingdoms? Are there other entities out there? There are. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. The multiverse. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. We were watching Flash last night, too. But anyway, um, so the kingdom of darkness is our first enemy. There's three enemies I put up here, right? The kingdom of darkness, our flesh, which is your sin nature, and the ways of the world. Those are the three enemies that we fight against. Do you see people up there? Do you see Democrats, Republican, liberal, conservative Anti-masker, masker, vaccine. Do you see any of that up there? Remember, we're citizens of the kingdom, right? And as citizens of the kingdom, we are aligned with our king. And any enemy of the king is our enemy. And that's our only enemy. Nothing else really matters, right? So if the king's enemies are the kingdom of darkness, our flesh, and the ways of the world, why do we fight each other? Why do we argue over things that really don't mean a whole bunch in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture, right? Because the big picture is eternity. The big picture is not this 78 to 100 years that you're on this planet. That's the little teeny picture. That's just the small piece that you were given to do his will, to do his will. Once you accept him, your job is to do his will. If you want to continue to fight and argue and, and you know, uh, uh, be about business that's not his, that's on you. You have free will. He gave you the choice. But that's not his will. You know, I'll jump off a little bit. Uh, a few months ago, or maybe a bit a year ago, I don't remember. It's been a while. I was uh, playing the drums up here, and the Lord gave me a vision. And the vision was, um, it was a pit. Now, you guys have heard this before. Anybody remember when I talked about the pit? Yeah? There was a pit, right? And in this pit, there were people who were just, they were, it was, it was muck, and it was mud and mire, and they were just throwing and fighting. They were just throwing this mud at each other and fighting, and it was just, it was bad. And it was huge. It was like thousands of people in this pit. And the pit wasn't super deep. It was maybe like six feet deep. So it was just over most people's heads, the top of it, Right? And I was on the outside, along with a lot of other people, who were leaning down and stretching, trying to pull people out of the pit. Some people we were able to pull out. Some people we got halfway, and halfway through, somebody threw mud at them, and they decided to jump back in and fight some more. Right? The pit was the world we live in, the world's ways, the world's system, the kingdom of darkness. It was our flesh. On the outside was the kingdom of God, where there was peace and joy and love, right? It's our job as citizens of the kingdom to pull people out of the pit, to not fight in the pit, okay? I'm saying this with love because I love you guys. We shouldn't be fighting in the pit. It's pointless. That's not, that's not our world. It's not our kingdom. You know, yes, we physically live here on earth. Yes, we physically reside in a country. The Bible tells us that you have to give due diligence to the, to the country or whatever the nation you live in. Pay your taxes. Do what you're supposed to do. Be a citizen. Be a good citizen because you're representing the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible tells us to. It tells us to be a good citizen, right? Because we know that that's not our world. 
Yeah, we're here. But in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture, in eternity, none of this stuff matters. What really matters is his will. We have to, okay? We really, really have to come to grips with changing the way we think. You can go out that door today. You can turn on your radio and listen to whatever and then immediately forget everything I talked about. And then you get home and you get in an argument conversation about politics or an argument conversation about something else. You missed it. You missed it just that bad. Right? We have three enemies. The kingdom of darkness, our flesh, and the ways of the world. The kingdom of darkness, in case you didn't know, Matthew 12, 25 through 26 says, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So there's your proof that there is a kingdom of darkness. Even Jesus said it, right? Ephesians 6, 12, and I know my wife would want me to read the whole thing because it's the armor of God, and she's all about that, but I'm just going to hit the highlights here. Um, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. And then he goes on talking about putting on the whole armor of God, right? Does anybody want to take a stab at what this means you know, what Paul meant when he wrote to the church in Ephesus, the authorities, the powers, and the spiritual forces. Anybody want to take a stab at what that means? Y'all ain't trying to help me out today. Perfect. Can, can we get him a mic so he can? I know. All right. No, you were right. No, you were loud. I just want to make sure the people on the live stream can hear it too. Say it again. Thank you. Did you guys get that? Did you guys even know that? That Satan had authority? You guys knew that? Oh, I thought God was in control. I thought God had everything under control and he was working it all out. Oh, he is. <laughs> no, he does. But yeah, so Satan does. Uh-oh, we have a question. Because we give him the authority. Well, God has already yeah. given him some authority, yeah, but, but yes, in, in our lives we give him authority because we submit to whatever it is that our flesh wants to do. But we, we let him. Yes, and we let him. You're absolutely right. Right. So you think about it. It's a kingdom. In a kingdom, there's hierarchy, right? And we're talking spiritual. We're not talking physical. Satan's kingdom is spiritual, right? And there's a hierarchy. There are certain places uh, in the world, and if, you're, if, you, if you've been born again, if you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, then you have discernment, right? When you go places, you can sense things. The Holy Spirit tells you things. You feel things, right? You can go to certain places and feel like, there's a spirit of oppression in this place. There's a spirit of fear in this place. There's a, a, you know, you can go to some cities and you can just feel the whole city feels wrong. Satan has set about his principal, principalities. You know, he's, con, he's set up controls in places. And that's what that is. That's what this verse is talking about. It doesn't matter to us. We don't walk in those things. We don't submit to those things, so... But we can feel it. We can sense it. And our job is to do what we do next. But I'll get to that. But we sense those things, right? So that's why we put on the whole armor of God. So we can stand against those things. When, when those attacks come against us, we can stand and, and fend those things off. All right? So that's the kingdom of darkness. And I'll try to move it through quickly. I'm sorry, guys. I'm taking a long time rambling. Our flesh. All right. Romans 8.5.8 8 says, So those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile, there's that word again, hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. What's the law of God? Love, right? 
for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When you're walking in your sinful nature, you cannot please God. But that doesn't apply to us, right? Because we're all children of God. We're redeemed. We're forgiven. Right? We're walking in that, walking in his forgiveness. All right? The last one up there. Oh, thank you. Uh, so <laughs> go back to the slides. The last one is the ways of the world. Now, I could have found a bunch of scriptures, but I, I did a quick research or a quick search online. And I found uh, there's this author, Gregory Boyd, Boyd Gregory Boyd. Um, I don't know his politics. I don't know his, his ideology. But he wrote something, and I, I, I read it, and I was like, wow, that's really good. But it needs to be tweaked just a little bit to be a bit more kingdom-focused. So I'm not plagiarizing Cheyenne. I took what he wrote, and I tweaked it you know, to make it, to me, more accurate. And it's a little bit, I'm going to read it all, but I want you to understand. So the ways of the world, and tell me if you recognize these things to be true, because when I read it, I was like, wow. All right. The world trusts the gun, while the kingdom of God trusts the power of God. The world advances by exercising power over, while the kingdom of God advances by exercising power under. I think Liana had said something about being under his power. The world seeks to control behavior through laws and social norms, while the kingdom of God seeks to transform lives from the inside out. The world is rooted in preserving, if not advancing, one's interest in one's own will, while the kingdom of God is centered on exclusively carrying out God's will, even if this requires you sacrificing your own interest. That's the kingdom of God. The world is tribal in nature, heavily invested in defending and advancing one's own people group or nation or ethnicity, or state, or religion, or your ideology, or your political agenda. That's why the world is full of kingdoms that are constantly fighting. The kingdom of God, however, is universal. It's centered on loving God, loving as God loves. It's centered on people living for the sole purpose of replicating the love of Jesus Christ to all people, at all times, in all places, without condition. That's the kingdom of God. The world is tit for tat, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. In this fallen world, no, ver- no version of the world can survive for long by loving its enemies or blessing those who persecute it. The world carries a sword, not the love of the Father. But the kingdom of God, the participants of the kingdom of God carry love, not the sword. They, we aren't supposed to return evil for evil, violence for violence. Rather, we're supposed to manifest the unique kingdom of Christ by returning evil with good, by turning the other cheek, by going the second mile, praying and loving our enemies, or at least those that are hostile towards the kingdom, right? Technically, they're enemies because they're hostile towards the kingdom, but they're really not our enemies. And far from seeking retaliation, we seek the well-being of our enemies. Again, it's, it's, they're not really our enemy. We want the best for them. If they're human beings... God loves them just as much as he loves us. Every, every person that was created, that's ever lived, that's lived right now, and every person that's going to live was made in the image of God with a purpose and a plan from him for their life. Every person has value. Doesn't matter what country they are from, their nationality, their skin color, they have value, and God loves them and sees them, and he created them for a reason, right? They can have one arm, no arms, one leg, no leg, whatever, He created them for a reason. They have value and they have a purpose. We need to see people that way. That's how you show love. You show love when you see people the way the Father sees people. You don't see them differently because they think differently. You see them because he loves them, you love them. And if they have a need, you love them, you supply that need. It's just that simple. That's how we show love. That's how the kingdom operates, right? And if you say... Well, what about Matthew 10, 34 through 36, where Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword, and I was going to make enemies of your own family. He did that. He did that when he established his kingdom. That's done. That's not for us to continue. He did that. How did he do that? He made it so that we could enter into the kingdom. And when you enter into the kingdom, is everybody going to be happy about that? Are your friends and family, like if you, if you were a drug addict, and you get saved, and you no longer do drugs, 
but you were the life of the party before you got drugged, right? Or before you, when you were doing drugs, before you got saved. If you go back and go talk to your friends, are they going to be happy about you entering the kingdom? No, they want, you, they want you back. They want you to be the life of the party again. So now they're your enemy because they're opposed to you. That's what Jesus meant when he said that. But really, are they your enemy? No, because he loved them. He loves them just as much as he loves you. And our job is to show them that, right? So the last one is contrast the battles. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of the world has earthly enemies and thus fights earthly battles. The kingdom of God, however, by definition, has no earthly enemies. Its disciples are committed to loving their enemies, treating them as friends and neighbors. There is warfare the kingdom of God is involved in, but it's not against the enemies of blood and flesh. It's rather against, and we read this before, uh, rulers against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. That's our enemy, and we talked about that. So what's the next slide? I think it's the one that was up there a second ago. So I ask the question now, why do we fight? You have that slide, Caleb? I think it's the 11. I don't think that's it. <laughs> that was the last slide. Slide number 11 says, why do you fight? Anybody want to give me a good reason why we fight? Bingo, bingo. To advance, the, yeah, you guys saw it. To advance, the, <laughs> you cheated. To advance the kingdom, absolutely, right? That's, that's our whole purpose. Our whole purpose is to love God, love our neighbors, advance the kingdom, right? So here's two questions I want to ask you, ask you before you go into battle. Before you go fight, two things you need to ask yourself every single time, every single time you feel like it's go time. Every single time you need to ask yourself these two questions without fail, Okay? Every single, every single time, all right? Number one, next slide. Am I about to war against a person, a worldly system or organization, or some other man-made entity? Am I about to war against a person, a worldly system or organization, or some other man-made entity? If your answer is yes, Stand down. You're missing the point. You, you just completely missed it. That's not our fight. That is not our fight. Question number two. Will this fight end in the advancement of the kingdom of God, expa ex expanding his reign, you know, expanding the reign of Christ the anointed king, or the creation of new enemies? I'll ask it again. Will this fight end in the advancement of the kingdom of God, expanding the reign of Christ, the anointed king, or the creation of new enemies? Sometimes both. Sometimes, yes, sometimes it's both. But if it's solely going to end in the creation of new enemies and you are not advancing the kingdom of God, stand down. It's not your fight. This is why I said some people aren't going to want to hear this, because some people like to fight. Some people like to argue. They got all the facts and figures, and they've done the research, and they can tell you one side up and one side down what's, what's right and what's wrong, and this is why. But as citizens of the kingdom, it's not our fight. It's not our fight. There's nothing wrong with knowing information. You know, I, and I'll say this real quick. Um, I used to quote Hosea 4 or 6 a lot, and it was for me it was justification for, you know, for getting education and research and things like that. And it's a scripture that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge, right? I used to quote it all the time. And that was like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be one of those people who doesn't have information, doesn't have knowledge. But there's this thing called context <laughs> that makes a whole lot of sense when you get it. So if you read Hosea 4.1, what it actually says is, there's no knowledge of God in the land. And when you get to 6, it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. The knowledge he's talking about is knowledge of him, right? It's the same way with everything we're doing. It's not that we're out here and we're going to flail around and be overtaken by the world because we're just, you know, we're wimps and we're, you know, 
we, we walk around like we don't belong. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. Our purpose is to advance the kingdom. Our fight is not what the world fights about. Our fight is his fight, and our fight is against his enemies, and our fight is spiritual. So you ask these two questions. Every time you feel like it's ready to go, it's, it's, it's go time, right? Every time you feel like it's time to fight, you ask yourself those two questions. And if you can answer those questions in the right way, it's time to fight. How do you fight? Anybody want to answer the question, how do we fight? As citizens of the kingdom of God, how do we fight? On your knees, in love, the word of God, prayer. Anybody else? Huh? Obedience. Y'all must have read my notes. All right, next slide. <laughs> this is how we fight. We fight by showing love. We fight by standing. That whole armor of God thing, people think, oh, I'm putting on the armor of God. I'm ready to go out and go to battle. But if you read it, it says like five times, stand, withstand. It doesn't tell you to go out and take anybody's head off. You put on the armor of God so you can withstand the enemy. Because what? The battle is not ours. It's his. We just have to make sure that we're not led astray. That's why you put on the armor of God, so that you're not taken out of the fight. Because if you don't have on that armor, if you don't understand what his word says, if you don't you know, have your feet shod with peace, if you don't have everything on, I know you're just dying to say it all, if you don't have all, all the armor, <laughs> you know, you're going to get led astray. Somebody's going to say something to you, it's going to rile you up, and then you're done. You're out of the fight. Just that fast. So you love, you stand, and then you pray, like Jamal said. That's how we fight. That's how we fight, right? Remember, the battle is the Lord's. It's not ours. He's already won the war. Anybody read Revelation? You know how it ends, right? <laughs> okay. So why are you stressing? Whether it happens in your lifetime or 10 lifetimes from now, why are you stressing? What, what's the point? Why, why are we so riled up about things that don't mean a hill of beans in the kingdom? Because that's where we reside. That's, that's where citizens of the kingdom. Right? Does everybody agree or disagree? All right. Amen. All right. Last slide. Guess what? We're done. <laughs> All right. So here's my summary. Our identity is rooted in who God said we are. If you claim Jesus as your Lord, additional labels can only remain as long as they don't oppose his reign. Okay? I'll say that again. Additional labels can only remain as long as they don't oppose his reign. You can be what you want to be, but if you choose another label after citizen, after child of God, after redeemed, after forgiven, if you choose another label, and it opposes what he says you are, you might want to check yourself before you wreck yourself. See, I threw it in there. All right? As citizens of the kingdom of God, our enemies are those that oppose the kingdom. Since the kingdom is spiritual, our real enemy is spiritual. We covered that. And the last one says, our fight is to advance the kingdom of God through living out Jesus' two foundational commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, being prepared to stand against the enemy's attacks, and praying continually. That's how we do it. That's how it's done. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to share. Uh, and again, my prayer is that you guys hear this and not just be hearers but doers. You know, you take this to heart. This is, this is the real world, right? This is real life. I understand what happens on the outside. And we, we, live, in, we live in a world that's fallen, and it's, you know, uh, the way I like to describe it is you've got uh, human beings doing the best they can to manage a fallen world. But that's not our struggle. That's not our fight. Our fight is to advance the kingdom. And we do that by loving, by standing, and by praying and bringing others into the kingdom. 
It's the Bible says it's the goodness of the Lord that draws people to repentance. It's not us beating them over the head with the Bible. It's us loving them, showing love, helping everyone who needs help. Because what's going to happen is God's going to put people in your path that he's already working on, and he's going to use something about you to draw them to him. It's not about you. It's about him drawing them, right? You're just a conduit for him. He's putting you in that position so you could help them come into the kingdom, and that's what it's all about. And as Mike said, the end goal is for us to get everybody on the planet into the kingdom of God. And then what happens then? What happens if everybody on the planet did Romans 10, 9 and confess with their heart and believe, you know, confess with their mouth and believe with their heart? What happens if everybody did that? Would we have communism? Would we have socialism? Would we have capitalism? No. Would we have any of the isms? I'm doing a plug for my Facebook group. Would we have any of the isms? No, we wouldn't have any of those. That's the goal. All right? So with that, thank you guys. I love you all. <laughs> George, you want to close this out? Thank you. I'm not skilled at closing out, so George will be there. Amen. We appreciate the Lord. Amen for Brother Rick. Amen. Let's, let's praise the Lord for Brother Rick. Amen. 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 That was good. How about this? How about this? How about my, my enemy is defined by my identity? That's good. My enemy is defined by my identity. And if you're wrestling with flesh and blood, then you're living according to your lower nature. Uh, if you are at war with other people, uh, then you're operating out of your flesh and you are questioning your own identity as a Christian. My enemy is defined by my identity, how I see myself, how I view myself. That's worth the price of admission this morning, isn't it? That's good. My enemy is defined by my identity. And so we, we kind of challenge ourselves uh, to remember who Christ has made us to be. And uh, some really good questions, really good uh, points uh, Raymond made a really good point about love today, uh, just understanding that all of the law is contained in you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others as yourself. If you can do that, you address the vertical, which is a priority, amen? And then you address the horizontal. Does this sound familiar to you? I think there's a guy by the name of Jason Evans that's been talking about that, right? Addressing our vertical relationship. And that will impact, it will influence, it will affect all of our horizontal relationships. And so that was a really good point by Raymond. We're not really going to unpack what Ivy talked about. The Bible says that uh, that was a really good, good question as well. Reverend Mike Dorsey's got a book coming out that's probably going to answer your question in more detail. Uh, we know that the origin of the enemy uh, of the devil is that he's an anointed cherub, so he was never identified as a son of God. Uh, but we will address that in detail in an upcoming book. Uh, so we're excited about how God's using Rick and Mike, uh, Jamal, amen, the entire family of God here at Riverside. You're excited about what God's doing in the kingdom? Amen? So many good points, Rick. So many good points. It's not us versus them. It's us for them. We exist for the world. Amen. We're not at war with the world. We exist for the world. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25 says, In meekness, opposing those, uh, instructing those that oppose themselves. So we, we are here for the world. It's not the church versus the world. But we are here for the world. And so if our hearts and minds are clear, um, really the only other thing that I would probably address uh, again is just understanding the kingdom of God. It is inherent. Um, so to be a child of God, to be a citizen of that kingdom, to be a good soldier for Jesus Christ, are all one in the same. Uh, I remember uh, during the message, someone saying that it's on the inside of you. It's on the inside of you. It's on the inside of you. It's inherent. The kingdom of God is not a parcel of land. The kingdom of God is a legion of people, amen, led by the king of glory. Who is this king of glory? Amen. And the kingdom of God is on the increase. It is on the rise. It is on the move. And we, we are approaching a defeated foe. Uh, Jesus has done for us all we need to do. The spoils of war belong to us as the children of God. And those spoils are souls. They're souls, folks. Those are the spoils of war. To the victor goes the spoils. And the spoils of war, they are your family members, your friends, your co-workers, 
The battle has already been fought. The victory has already been won. And the spoils of war belongs to us as citizens of the kingdom of God. And the church said amen, amen. and amen. Amen. We're going to ask you all to stand with me. It's a good word today. It's a good word. I love that word. He's kind of got Mike's. I always say it's different styles. So Mike is professorial and Rick is the same way. I love, I took notes. I love that style of teaching. Reminds me, it's a, uh, reminds me of David Jeremiah or Jack Hayford. So there are different styles, different techniques. And I just enjoyed that today. I felt like I was in class and I hope I get an A, Rick. That was good. That was good. Father, we thank you right now for the people of God gathered here together in the sanctuary and for the family of God that are viewing on the live stream. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity to come together in the name of our Lord, in the name of our Savior, in the name of Jesus, the anointed King. We thank you, God. What an honor, what a privilege to be citizens. And it's inherent, God. It's on the inside of us, God. We know that wherever we go, the kingdom goes with us, God. We go as ambassadors of this king, representing him in all we say and all we do. And so we just thank you, God, for understanding of who we are because our enemy, God, is defined, is determined by our identity. It's so important for us to know who we are. And we just thank you, God. We're your beloved. We are children of the king. God, it's to nothing that we've done. And we thank you, God. Your children are black. Your children are white. Your children are red. They're yellow. Father God, they are Asian. They are Filipino. They are Latino, God. You've got children on the East Coast and the West Coast, God. Some talk with a Southern draw, God. And there are some, Lord God, Father, that speak, Lord God, with a French accent. But the children of God are all over this planet, God. We thank you right now. Father, for this family and for this move of your spirit that's occurring right now. We're encouraged, Father. We're encouraged. We're encouraged. In spite of what is taking place in the world, we know, God, what your word says. And even as Elder Rick mentioned, God, Father God, we've read the book. There's a spoiler alert, God. We know how this thing turns out. And so we're encouraged, God. We're encouraged because we trust above what our eyes see, above what our ears hear, and above what our heart understands. Well, God, we trust what your word says. And we just thank you right now, God. Father God, even as we're gathered together, Lord God, we bless, we bless, we bless the man of God. We bless Jason Evans. We bless Tina Evans, God. Long life, good days, God. Bless coming in and bless going out, God. We thank you, God. There's no lack, no lack, no lack in any part of their lives. We thank you, God, for recovering health, God, for strengthening grace, as Mike would say. And we thank you that they'll be gathered together here with us very shortly, God. But in the meantime, we thank you, God, that though our pastor is absent, Lord God, our king is present. And so we just give you the glory and the honor and the praise, God. And even as we depart, God, we depart, Lord God, in that spirit of joy, Lord God, in that spirit of peace, God, in the righteousness, God, that flows, God, from your heart to our heart, Lord God, from your spirit to ours, God. It's righteousness. It's peace. It's joy in the Holy Ghost. It's you, Jesus. You are the king of the kingdom, God. And we thank you right now, God, for overflowing joy, God, for righteousness, God, and for peace, God, that overflows, God, that we can share, God, with the waitress this afternoon. We can share, God, with the, uh, with the, uh, the folks, Lord God, at the grocery store, God, your peace. We love you today, Father. Thank you for this gathering together, for this opportunity to gather together, God, to worship you, God. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee, the Lord be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, the Lord grant thee peace. Go in the same, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.